Hey guys, Richard here with the Government Sales Momentum Podcast. This week, we're going to take a, a little bit of a different path. Normally, we present you know the strategies and techniques to acquire government contracts, a little bit about troubleshooting uh, once you're on contract with the government. But it did occur to me, you know, when I'm listening to podcasts or subject matter experts, I do like to understand where they came from, how they developed their expertise. And I thought I'd take this episode to walk you through my path. And although I've touched a little bit on, you know, some of the jobs I've had prior to starting a consulting company, prior to government sales momentum, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of my history. So Getting started, I grew up in Massachusetts, just north of Boston. I went to high school, went to a private high school up here and college as well. I went to Salem State College. And then I, during the last year or so of college, my senior year, I really felt a calling to join the military. So I really wanted to be a military officer. And so I investigated the different branches of service and really uh, honed in on the Air Force. That was really where I wanted to be. So I spent some time preparing for the officer qualification test, which is one of the prerequisites if you want to be a military officer. And by the way, if you have, if you're thinking about it, or you have maybe a son or daughter thinking about officership, and you have some questions, just feel free to shoot that to me. I'm very passionate about the military officer program. It completely changed my life. And it is really uh, an amazing journey if you're considering that as a career or, or maybe even just for, you know, four to six years. But for me, it was the Air Force. And so I took the Air Force officer qualification test. And the other uh, prerequisite to becoming an officer is you need a bachelor's degree. So I was inevitably accepted into the Air Force as an officer. So in 1999, I packed up my bags and went to Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, which is where our officer training school is. So there's three paths to becoming a military officer. There is officer training school, what they call us, you know, the 12, 13 week wonders where you just, um, after college, you meet the prerequisites. If you are accepted, you, you would go through that program. There's ROTC, which you've uh, probably heard of where, you know, you can be part of the ROTC program going through college, and then you would receive your commission after graduating. And then of course there are the academies like the Air Force Academy, uh, West Point, et cetera, where you would receive your commission after graduating. So for me, it was officer training school. And at the end of that 12 to 13 weeks in Alabama, I received my commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. And the Air Force decided I was going to be a navigator well, we, and we actually call that a combat systems officer as a profession now. But so a navigator would be doing a lot of the planning for um, for air operations, flying with the pilots and whatever other air crew there uh, for navigating. And there are a lot of uh, aircraft that we still use navigators on for a variety of reasons. So after officer training school, I then went to flight school in San Antonio, Texas. And that was a really great year. Really enjoyed that. I was a brand new officer and made some great uh, friendships there as I was going through the year plus of flight school with, you know, uh, 12 plus uh, individuals that, you know, were in my class. And, we, you know, we would do everything together from taking all our classes to flying. It was really intensive. Um, but so was, you know, the, the bonds and the friendships we created there. And um, I, I really look back to my time at flight school fondly. And after graduating from flight school with my silver wings as a navigator, um, I went to survival school and I received my aircraft. So once you, you know, at some point during your flight training, you're going to, as you're approaching the end, you're going to have a, a drop and you'll eventually get your aircraft. Um, for me, that was the RC-135 rivet joint. And that is a intelligence surveillance and, and reconnaissance aircraft. And they fly, at least for me, out of off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. So that's where I was headed after San Antonio. Now, at off at Air Force Base in San Antonio. So now I've lived in Massachusetts, Alabama, Texas, and now I'm in Omaha. And that was all in under two years, you know, kind of moving, <laughs> moving from place to place. So interesting culturally for me just to, to live in different parts of the country and establish friendships. But, you know, the, the training was really amazing and changing for me, learning how to process a lot of information um, quickly, especially when, you know, you're flying and things are happening really fast and you have a lot of different things to keep track of and um, really enjoyed that. And as I was going through the training at, in Omaha, Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base for the RC-135, 9-11 happened. So 
Um, as you could probably imagine, you know, since I was flying ISR aircraft, which we fly combat reconnaissance uh, missions, reconnaissance operations worldwide, we were in extremely, extremely high demand. So I got checked out and I feel like I spent the first 10 years of this century <laughs> deployed nonstop um, all over the place. So typically I would return to you know, Omaha for, you know, maybe a month or two to get some more training or to just, you know, rest for a bit. But, you know, it was usually back out the door, constantly back and forth. And, you know, that, that wears you down for a little bit, but I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed my time there. And after about five or six years of doing that, I did a one year remote to uh, the island of Crete in Greece. And there, so I was doing a lot of different things for the Air Force there, but I got to spend one year on the island of Crete. That was, that was fantastic. I mean, talk about um, amazing food and, um, you know, the, the weather and everything else that you might think of. And then proximity to Europe, just being able to travel, you know, with my dad and, um, you know, some friends. So that was another really, really great year in, in mission wise, uh, also amazing. Got to do a lot of interesting things like working with um, other countries' uh, military. So, you know, we, we have, we call joint operations flying with between services, Navy, Air Force, you know, Army, et cetera. Um, but then we also have our uh, foreign nation partners that we'll fly with. So I got to do a lot of that out there and it was really interesting and, and it really stuck with me. From Greece, now, at this point, I have been, you know, really traveling and deploying a lot and a lot of flying. And at this point, uh, the Air Force asked me to come back to San Antonio and be an instructor at the flight school that I graduated from, which I, I really want to do because I had such, like I mentioned, such a good time there. And, you know, the camaraderie there with all the other instructors was really something I was looking forward to. And, and, and all of that happened when I got back to San Antonio. It was really amazing kind of now approaching that as, you know, a captain, almost major, um, which is the kind of transition point between a company grade officer and the military. So I think second lieutenant, first lieutenant, captain, you know, and these are your you know, at least in the Air Force, these in flying, especially these are your doers. These are the ones flying the planes and really mastering their, um, you know, the profession that they came into. But, you know, at that point, you're also transitioning into leading people. Right. So the military officers are the leaders, the managers of the of the military services. So now I was also transitioning into leading, you know, quite a few people in different organizations that I was being put in charge of. And all of that was great. And it was an amazing experience, but probably the best thing about San Antonio is where I met my wife. And uh, we met uh, probably the last year or so that I was instructing there in 2009 and had a really great time there. And we decided to get married towards the end of my uh, tenure there in San Antonio, which we did. We flew out to St. John. We got married on the beach. It was amazing. And then uh, we, we packed everything up and moved to Warner Robins, Georgia to fly the J-Stars aircraft. And so uh, J-Stars, which if you haven't heard of it, um, you may have heard of AWACS. And AWACS, you know, it, you've seen it in movies, I'm sure. It's, it's a huge uh, aircraft with a, a radar disc on the top of it. It's used for command and control. It's kind of like air traffic control only in the air when we're flying missions you know we have air battle managers in the back that can uh, figure out where all the aircraft are and make sure that everyone's deconflicted and everyone stays safe well the j stars think of it as the AWACS only there's a radar on the bottom of the aircraft so now you're looking at ground targets and people on the ground and there's some other things that it does but that is a really interesting aircraft another like the uh, rj another high demand operational high ops tempo aircraft. And yeah, during our, our term there, um, you know, newly married, uh, we had my daughter, you know, just a little over a year after we got married, I deployed two weeks after she was born. So, you know, flying missions out there and a little bit stressful for me and the wife, you know, just, you know, being apart like that with a newborn, uh, I came back and my uh, only to find we had my second son, who was born uh, very soon after that. So they're about a year apart. And so that was great. It was an amazing time. Uh, I was really busy doing jobs like uh, wing executive officer and, and flying missions, but really loved it and learned a lot. And from there, kind of the reward for doing a lot of those different types of jobs, especially as you're now, I was a major, so a field grade officer. So company grade uh, captain, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, 
But then when you hit major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, you become a field grader. So now your, your scope of responsibility increases. And part of that journey for a lot of us is they'll send you to a master's degree program for a year where you just go to school and you learn a little bit more about senior leadership and how to work with different services, different countries. And that was great. That was in Alabama, back to Alabama at uh, you know the same base where I went through officer training school. And an amazing one-year program. You know, when you, when you hear things like Air Command and Staff College, Air War College, these are these are one-year master's degree programs that have um, officers from not only all of the services. So even though it's Air Command and Staff College, um, for me at this point, you know, there were Navy, Marines, Army officers there. There were officers from I think there's over 50 different countries that were going to this school, which really created an amazing. Uh, amazing classroom scenarios where, you know, as we're going through different operations and military strategy and getting to hear, you know, um, you know, what was the perspective, you know, for instance, when for Operation Iraqi Freedom from, um, you know, colonels uh, in different countries that were in the Middle East. And, you know, that that's invaluable because you really it can broaden how you think, because, you know, it's easy to think one way. You know, if you listen to, you know, one particular news channel or you have one particular job and you're, you're laser focused and you think things are the way they are. But then you hear the perspectives of all these other people that have had some amazing experiences. It, it's really broadening. And you also learn a little bit about acquisitions during that school and how the military buys things. So that's when I first started learning about the acquisitions process and funding and how we put companies on contract. Additionally, I was I had a special moniker going through there. Um, I was being trained as a political and military affairs strategist. So um, that was to allow me to work with different countries. Um, you know, in jobs to come. So jobs after that school, so I could work with them, whether it was for foreign military sales or diplomatic um, endeavors that kind of prepares you for that. Now, as amazing as that year was, one, um, one thing happened at the end of that year, which changed all of our lives forever. And that was, I mentioned, um, you know, my second child was born in Georgia. Um, that was my son. And at the end of my master's degree program, he was one year old, just a little bit over one. And he was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer called Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And that just, that really knocked the wind out of everybody's sails. And it, it became very clear we were laser focused on getting him healthy. And so, um, although we had orders going to Pensacola, uh, Florida after that, and, you know, at this point, you know, you usually go on to command different squadrons and units, which is, which is where I was headed. Um, you know, we were now very much focused on getting Mac uh, healthy and uh, who is my son's name. So, now, looking at the the hospitals in Alabama, they were they were great. But every day, you know, we were at the Children's Hospital there. We would get a notification saying, "Hey, you know, we just talked to Dana Faber in Boston, and this is what they're directing us to do." And it became very evident that Dana Faber and Boston Children's Hospital are, are one of the premier hospitals in the world for treating what my son had. And so we decided that for us, we needed to be in Boston at Dana-Farber. That's where we wanted him to be treated. And the Air Force did a great job. Everyone I'd work with, uh, they changed my orders and, and changed my entire career at that point. So that's when I switched from flying to acquisitions uh, because uh, Hanscom Air Force Base, which is the big Air Force Base in Massachusetts, they don't have a flying mission. They are an acquisitions base, meaning the profession of putting companies on contract for the government. So now I had to change careers, which really for me was secondary to, you know, getting my son healthy, which he is. Uh, Dana Farber did an amazing job. Um, he's been cancer free now for years. And, you know, uh, I can't thank them and the doctors there enough. Uh, they did such an amazing jo job. If, uh, and by the way, if you know anyone that has uh, been diagnosed with LCH, we saw Dr. Degar at, uh, at Dana Farber and I, I credit her with saving my son's life, like hands down. So uh, Mac was on the road to recovery. Everyone was really happy. In the meantime, I was learning all about acquisitions because not only was I uh, jumping into acquisitions um, as a program manager for the first time in my career, but I was also as a field grade officer and almost a lieutenant colonel at this point, um, I was being put in charge of people doing that job. So I had to really learn um, the job of acquisitions. And uh, if you think about um, you know, what a military officer does, the, the ultimate, you know, if you stay in for long enough and you do well enough, you become a general officer, right? And so the general officer 
really needs to be able to go into any situation and lead. That's why it's general. So not just flying, not just battle on the ground, but get through, you get thrown into so many different realms uh, that you really need to be able to adapt your leadership style. And so this was a big challenge for me. So I had to, you know, with all the flying and operational experience I had, I now had to learn the acquisitions um, all of the rules and the federal acquisitions regulations and, and how we worked with finance and engineering and in the different companies um, that we were putting on contract. So it was really an amazing time for me as far as expanding what I was doing. And we really had an interesting uh, angle there too. The, the branch I went into had just uh, some of the work, the contracts they were managing had gone away before I got there. And I, I still remember the uh, the senior leader there said, hey, look, Rick, and some of the guys I was working with, here you have a branch with you know about you know, 50, 60 people in it, but not a lot of work. And goes, hey, and there's no funding. So, you know, we'll talk about things like PEs in other episodes, but because there was no contract and there was no real funding there, he's like, look, you guys can make this into what you want it to be. Um, so he was pretty hands off, which let us really create an amazing unit. So I'll tell you, watching that go from, you know, a bunch of guys kind of looking for things to do, not really sure to, we started, you know, from my perspective, one, one thing I did understand was the operational need, right? And I knew what it felt like to be uh, an aviator, um, an airman out there um, in the field, needing a technology or having something that didn't quite work. And then wondering, you know, where are the guys that are supposed to supply me with the new thing or the technology that we need to defeat the enemy, enemy or to save lives. And so I wanted to help solve that problem. I wanted to expedite that. So we focused almost exclusively on rapid acquisitions. We were rapidly acquiring things and getting them out to the warfighter. In fact, this is very non-standard, but we were deploying our engineers. We were doing some really great things um, as far as quickly developing technology and putting it in the hands of somebody that needed it. Um, and, and, you know, we went from zero to a billion dollars in funding. Um, and, and there are ways to find funding for things. So this is something that I talked to some of my clients about. So especially if you're in tech development um, and you're trying to sell to the government and they talk about funding, there are ways to shake some money loose from the trees in the government. We were really, really good at that. Um, so that's that's probably a conversation for a different episode. But it really sparked my um, my passion for acquisition, seeing how we could do things pretty quickly and really make an impact. And one of the things I noticed during this is, uh, I know I, I ran a, a cell called Material Solutions Analysis at one point, where all I did was met with companies that had technologies I was potentially interested in. And I really got to see firsthand the struggle companies with great technologies, great products, great services have, especially small businesses selling to the government when they don't understand the process or they have a minor understanding of the process. I also got to see, you know, there were a few small businesses that were really good at it and they and the big OEMs, we got the big defense contractors, they really had a system down for business development, for marketing, for getting their technology in front of the right people, for targeting. Uh, and that's really what I've based my entire strategy on with my clients is, hey, you know, we want to take you from maybe not knowing much or doing it in a way that's not going to give you the results that you're looking for to, hey, let's mimic some of these companies and the way that I saw them really generating sales and, and it's working. So that was really an eye-opening and profound experience for me. I did, uh, after about four or five years of that, I did a uh, one-year remote to Saudi Arabia. I worked in the Saudi Arabian Ministry of Defense for a year. Um, I was the uh, US government's representative there. So basically I was managing their foreign military sales and, and they were at the time our biggest purchaser of foreign military goods uh, or military goods from us. So you know all of the contracts, the negotiations between the two governments, a lot of the diplomatic things that had to uh, that were involved there, it was really a chance for me to put together everything I learned in acquisitions, my operational background, and then the political and military affairs strategist piece I learned at Air Command and Staff College. I got to really tie all of that together and really work at some high levels there, um, and that was really enjoyable. Now I was approaching uh, the twenty-year mark. I came back to Hanscom, and um, one of the one of the things in the military is that typically if you volunteer for one of these one-year remotes, you can, you know, I could keep my family at Hanscom. I could return, and I had about a year left at that point. I worked on a, a large weapon system program uh, for that last year, and then I retired. And once I retired, I decided that I wanted to, you know, help some of those small businesses um, provide those technology services products 
to the government and really keep, I wanted to keep making an impact. So I felt like this was the best way I could do that. And it became um, very apparent to me after, you know, consulting, I don't know, you know, probably 50 to a hundred uh, companies that putting a podcast together with a repository of information that I could put out there to you uh, would be beneficial because it was the same, you know, I found myself kind of giving the same speech over and over again, like how acquisitions works and, you know, or maybe you know, how a company could tweak what they're doing to see better results. And that really led to this, this whole podcast and to the consulting piece. And it allows my family and I to stay in Boston and, you know, now and then I can travel for clients and go to conferences and, you know, go to meetings as I need to. So it's really helped and we're really enjoying it. I'm really passionate about the, uh, the especially the defense acquisitions process, but um, but government procurement in general, um, it, it's a interesting skill set. It is complex, but it can be done properly, you know, with the right amount of effort and timeline. Um, you know, if you're listening to this in your company and you're looking to go on contract for the first time, you know, it's just really getting that process down, being targeted in your approach, having some of the right techniques in place, um, developing those relationships. So anyone out there wants to talk to me more about this, you can go to my website, richardchoward.com, fill out a consultation. We give a free 30 minute consultation. Glad to talk to you and have a great week. Have a great uh, 2022. All right. Take care.